I'm really excited to bring you our guest for today. Her name is Jackie Scully. She's a teacher in the United States, and she has been hosting a podcast called The Teacher Story, and her mission is to elevate the voices of teachers and let them tell their stories and just get people thinking about the emotional side of being a teacher and to give some support to teachers. It's a great show. Highly recommend that you check it out on all the podcast platforms. Jackie's an experienced history and psychology teacher. She is the creator and host of The Teacher Story, which features her own story and then also interviews with teachers. Her goal is to elevate teacher voices and others in education and put them at the forefront of the education reform movement. She's also a co-founder of The Teacher Circle. It's a LinkedIn group that is a global community designed to support teachers and others in education. And we had a fantastic conversation around what she sees as the current situation in U.S.-based schools and related also how that compares to people that she has talked to who are international educators and how COVID affected everything and also kind of her suggestions for making education better. And it was a fantastic conversation. She's a very interesting person with a lot of great ideas. We recorded this on October 9th, 2022, and I know you're going to enjoy it. So here we go. Hello, Jackie. Welcome to the podcast. So how are you and where are you today? Thank you so much for having me on here. Um, I am in New Jersey and I have the day off from school. So it's really nice to spend this time talking with both of you today. So maybe you can share with us a little teacher story. Yeah. So I have the podcast, The Teacher's Story, and I have met some incredible teachers that teach internationally some that are American teachers that are either in the profession or are leaving the profession. But this one international teacher named Jess Goslin that I had on the show, she was in Taiwan and she just moved to Poland. And she uh, started to be a part of this whole organization called Women in Ed. And that actually helped her to advance and get a higher role in this new school in Poland. And she's also an author and has written about international teaching. And so when I had her on my podcast, she just shared so much about the joys of teaching abroad. And then when both of you reached out to me to look to see like my work uh, with the the teachers that I've met, and I was like, this is kind of kismet because I was having all of these international teachers on my show. And then you reached out to me and I was like, of course, I'd love to share more about that. Great. Well, our guiding question today fits in with that. The question is, what are you hearing from U.S. and international teachers and how they're feeling about their careers as educators? And uh, I guess David wants to lead in. Sure. And just as you said, you have this uh, wonderful podcast, The Teacher Story, uh, and you have a very interesting format. So before we maybe jump into that question, could you just describe the format of your podcast? Sure. And actually, the motivation with creating the podcast is tied to this guiding question. So in the winter of 20, I would say 2021 into 2022, I was listening to some different teachers in different online communities about their frustrations with teaching in America in various areas and wanting to transition out of the classroom. And the more and more stories that I heard, it was just really heartbreaking. And I saw the challenges like in the American education system. And I thought, well, I did not have the same experience, but it was really challenging during the pandemic. And there was definitely still a feeling of a lack of teacher respect. And I felt that we never get to share our side of it, you know, like, the media is going to spin this. They're going to just see all these teachers leaving and no one's going to know why. So I wanted to first share my story. And then I wanted to meet with teachers that I know personally and those that I've connected with online to share their stories and share their voice. So the whole arc of the interview is, you know, first, what was your inspiration to get into education? Because we want to see like, where is the heart? Like, even if a teacher leaves the classroom, that part of them does not leave them. They will always be an educator. 
And then looking at early experiences, which those are usually when we have some really fun stories, how the pandemic changed education and their takeaways from that. And then really the big goal of the podcast is education reform. And I've had a lot of teachers on, like I said, from other countries, but my first motivation was how are we going to make some change in America? Because this system is really falling apart. And if we're going to see this, you know, mass teacher exodus, like something has to be addressed. And it's the teachers who should be sharing their ideas because they are there in the classroom and in the schools and they know what is not working. And so how do we fix that? So that's kind of like where I wanted to start this podcast, which I started, I launched it last May of 2022. Well, so I think it's an excellent idea, great venture. And I have enjoyed listening to some of the teacher stories that you've shared. And it's true that teacher voices are often not heard and pushed to the back. And, you know, when education planning is done, it doesn't necessarily factor in how teachers are feeling and the teacher side of the story. So what are some specific concerns that you're hearing in your conversations with U.S.-based educators? The number one concern is teacher respect. The respect for teachers in America has gone down over the last couple of decades. The pandemic really, in some areas, it became worse, which you think that there'd be more appreciation for what the teachers Mm. were doing. Mm -hmm. Salary is pretty low in many places around the country. It's very drastic how different it is. Like You could have teachers making a very livable, great salary, like a lot of schools in the Northeast or even some like out West. And then there's a lot of schools in the South and Midwest where some uh, beginning teachers are still making like $30,000, $35,000. And there isn't this big jump each year in your salary. I mean, it could take a decade or more just to make like $10,000 more. And as we see inflation rising, I mean, it's becoming, it's a working class job. And teachers also are expected to get advanced degrees. So you're expected to get a master's degree now. That wasn't the expectation when I was in school. Not many of the the teachers I had had master's degrees. Almost every teacher I know is expected to have a master's degree, which is great, Mm -hmm. but you usually have to pay for that. And then Mm -hmm. you're getting this like measly salary. Mm -hmm. And then during like the pandemic, I think it was just so much was put on teachers' plates and they didn't have any time or space to like actually live their own life because virtual teaching, especially when it was new, you had to do so much preparation for that. I mean, I remember spending Sundays, five, six hours preparing like my website, videos, all of the different things that you had to do for also hybrid, like those at home, those in person. And like our pay was frozen. I know some areas that their their pay went down. And then inflation again started to go up. It's just like, it was a breaking, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the end of 2021 into 2022 became this whole catalyst of teachers going, I'm not doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. I got to get out. Some of them went into other teaching paths in different ways. And, you know, this is why I think it's great for us to have this conversation today. It's because I think international teaching can definitely be a resource for those teachers, but a lot also went into completely different fields and they're heartbroken over it. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to leave, you know? And I think it's great that you mentioned salary and respect in the same breath, because I think it's important for people to understand that while salary, I mean, teachers, you don't get into it for the money. I like, it's not like people think, oh, I'm going to be a teacher and make a bunch of money. Not happening. Mm -hmm. But salary is a sign in a way of, a, it's a measure of respect, you know, of saying you're worth a certain amount. So, so it is tied in no matter what you say. And the whole idea of saying, well, we've got these extra expectations, you know, educationally and so on, and yet we're not paying for it, but yet we're freezing your salary. I mean, it's, it's incredibly demoralizing when things like that happen. So thank you for, for explaining all of that. Absolutely. And I guess I want to come at this from a couple angles that we've all been social studies teachers, Jackie, you still are, from a societal point of view. When I'm looking at the whole career spectrum of the folks in university right now who are thinking about becoming educators to the ones where Audrey and I are in our 60s now, and I remember during my career reading from time to time about this core group of women educators who are my age. And writers were saying they were the last group of educators who really 
didn't see many other options in life, becoming a physician, a lawyer, doctor. It was there, but a lot of them leaned into becoming an educator because it would be uh, more workable for their family life and things like that. So a lot of very, very talented, mainly female uh, educators who naturally were going to retire once they to their late 50s and 60s. And then what I'm reading is, just as you're saying, Jackie, they're retiring in droves. So we're losing out that huge knowledge and talent base. And then we go back to what's it like in university now? Um, mm. You're looking at these 20-year-olds. They've gone through the pandemic. And I wonder how many of them are questioning, is it really worth going into education. And I guess the second thing that's happening economically here in the U.S. is, especially in the service industry, a lot of the wages are finally starting to go up, but these are more in the lower level. People are getting above minimum wage and corporations are being forced to pay people more or people are changing jobs. Well, clearly that's not happening in the field of education. We don't have that market dynamic going on. So I'm wondering if you can speak to maybe both ends of the spectrum. I don't know if you're chatting with any very young teachers mm -hmm. and what it's been like. And I know you're chatting with some who are who are leaving the, the profession. Yeah, a couple of areas I'll touch upon is at the university level, they're seeing a much lower rate of people going into education. So you have that. You don't have as many students wanting to major in education. Then you have you know, first, just naturally, we have the baby boomer population. A lot of them are just retiring, right? And they were the ones who stayed in education for probably the longest because, you know, it was a different time. There was more respect back in, you know, that mm. time period. And they made it their life profession. And now they're leaving. And then you have these young teachers who've been in it for only a couple of years. So their experience has been the pandemic. And they're like, I, I can't do this anymore. So they're not committed. And when, if you're like two, three years in and you're already like, this isn't for me, it's much easier to leave than say someone who's been in it for like 10, 20 years. You know, you might have more of a commitment to the school, the community, your retirement plan, all of that. But I've actually had quite a few teachers on that are kind of at my age range. I'm 40 years old. I've been in it for 17 years who made the difficult decision to leave. So, I mean, they committed almost two decades to teaching and they're like, I'm done. I'm leaving. And that to me, that's a real sign that there's something really broken because you have committed teachers who have made it their life mission. And now they're like, I have to do it. And they're the ones that are the most heartbroken because mm -hmm. it was something that was always part of them. But the lack of students going into the profession, the many retiring and now transitioning, I mean, we're seeing a crisis in America in some states where they have emergency hires because they just literally don't have enough teachers. And I just see this as a big brain drain in this country. I don't know long-term what education is going to look like. And education is very different in areas of the country because there's certain areas where you can't teach certain curriculum. And I often have said this to my students because I'm fortunate at my school where it's pretty open and we could talk about a lot of different social justice topics and whatnot. But I'm like, we're going to have two Americas where there's going to be students who get the real American history story, right? That are going to learn about different identities and different groups of people who have exposure to that diversity. And then you're going to have other areas of the country that literally it's getting taken out of the curriculum. That is really long-term a problem too, because you're going to have mindset wise, two different Americas. Which will just, you know, feed into the problem that we're already experiencing with the divided country. So you've interviewed international teachers and you've interviewed U.S.-based teachers. Are there some themes that, that are in common that are coming out of those interviews or would you say that it's really quite a different experience? For the international teachers are the ones that I have seen have more respect in their field where they're teaching, at least in the countries they're in. So I've interviewed that teacher I mentioned, Jess, who was in Taiwan and then moved to Poland. I interviewed a, a new teacher who's in Dubai and she loves it. I did have a teacher on that transitioned out of the classroom and they were in South Korea and then came back to the United States to teach and, you know, explained that it was very, very different, you know, and almost like, why did I leave South Korea, you know, and came back mm. to America and salary wise, respect wise, politics. It was just when you especially go abroad and come back to America, it could be really 
hard to want to stay in it because it's just so different. So from my experience in those conversations, the ones that decided to go into international teaching have had really great experiences. Pandemic is probably, besides lockdowns, when we talk about teaching during the pandemic, there are some similarities and struggles, particularly with like internet connection, getting the students engaged. So I think that part, there's some similarities, but not how society kind of pushed back, like how we saw it in America, not really hearing that from teachers who are teaching in other countries. I've had some teachers on from the UK, so they're in another country, but that's their home country. And some of them have explained that it's kind of similar to America, but not as drastic with the lack of respect and pushback with curriculum, but that they're kind of tired of the traditional system, testing, right? Always yeah. about the scores, always looking at that as a data point. Their pay isn't very, you know, very good either. And so I think there's some similarities with teachers who are based out of the UK. So there's been some connection with that, but I've heard really great benefits from the international teachers I've had on the show. And that gets at, uh, I guess, what we call national teachers. And it's it's pretty neat how you've got your, your your fingers on the pulse of what's happening in other countries for the local teachers. And I do wonder, we want to be careful with the term crisis, but we are in a crisis. I think we were going to be in the U.S. in one anyway, because as we're talking about the baby boomers retiring and losing, as you're saying, that it's a, a brain drain. And now with young people coming in, And part of young people coming in, do they have the life experiences to be able to handle all of the ups and downs of a normal classroom and the socioeconomic difficulties and the struggles that go there? You really have to have some life experience to be able to grow your wisdom, to be able to be a competent teacher. Are there any other national teachers that you've spoken to, any other stories that they've shared with you that kind of caught your interest? Yeah, I want to focus on this young teacher. Uh, She's just this really, you know, bubbly, passionate primary school teacher, and she's in Dubai. And she purposely wanted to leave the UK to go teach abroad because she was like, did my student teaching in the UK. You know, again, very structured, very traditional. I wanted a different experience. And she's at like a, I don't know the name of the school, but a prominent school in Dubai. And she, you know, there's still things that she wants to be able to infuse into the school more community events. It's a um, like pre-K through 12 program. So it's similar to my school. It's three division school. So like connecting uh, the different divisions together, but she's had like a really great experience. And again, she, she stressed that I have my rent paid for. I have a really great salary. It's more than what I would make in the UK and that she's, it's expanding her mind to also look at other places that she would like to visit the future and go and teach there. So she's young And she's got this vision to stay in it because she went abroad and she's having a good experience. If she was in my country or if she stayed in the UK as this young, bright, passionate teacher, she could have burnout in like a couple of years, you know, and then all of that energy and all of that passion she has, she would have to probably decide to leave and, you know, go into something else. So I think that kind of story of if you're really passionate about being an educator and you go and you find a place where you can flourish, then it becomes like your life's mission instead of feeling beaten down and forced out of something that you really love and that you wanted to give your heart to. So what about people that you've spoken to who are nationals of another country? I think you might have mentioned that you talked to someone who is Kenyan, teaching in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Am I getting Mm -hmm. that right? Have you felt that they are experiencing some of the same things, you know, the diminishing respect and the the more challenging nature of teaching than in the past? Yeah, that's actually, mm-hmm. that's interesting that you brought this teacher up. She's actually studying in Germany right now and wants to work on building a mentorship program that then she can bring back to Kenya. So she worked in, I think it was an all girls school in Kenya. And So two different things here. There is actually higher respect there for teachers. It's considered like one of the top professions in a lot of African countries because I have some friends in other parts of Africa. But there's just the workload, again, the structure. It's all about testing too. And it's very rigid. It's not about the whole child. So one thing she stressed is that it's all about advancement, but not actually taking care of your mental health, your physical health, and like 
they would be at school for so long. She was mentioning like six in the morning to like six at night. And so basically families see schools, which we have like talked about during the pandemic, but really seeing it as like childcare, you know, and like those teachers or the school system itself is there for the child much, much longer in a day than even the parents are with the, the child. So there's a lot of challenges in that way. But the teacher respect and looking up to that as a noble profession is present in Kenya. But the work day and the workload is not sustainable. Mm. So that's a big challenge. So grass isn't always greener on the other side yeah. of the fence. It depends on where you go. It's, there's, yeah. yeah, no, it, absolutely. This is so true. And that's something that we talked about when we interviewed with your podcast is you really, as someone who's considering going global, you really should do your research. We've David and I have talked about that a lot in all our podcast episodes. But one of the things you might really be wise to research is what is the level of teacher respect at the school that you're considering going to? And maybe you can ask for the email of someone who is a teacher or even, you know, a trick that David has is, you know, thinking that, well, someone who's at a school really may not be giving you the full honest truth because they don't want to, you know, jeopardize their position. And so get someone who used to teach at the school. But even then you need to take it with a grain of salt and, and not get too caught up in, you know, not going somewhere because of one or two small negatives. But I think that asking about, you know, what level of respect do you think teachers are feeling at your school? What is the morale level at your school are some good questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, because I think it's very easy to get wrapped up to the benefits, right, of going abroad. But you always want to try to talk to people. I mean, in any kind of industry, you always want to talk to people that are actually there and get kind mm-hmm. of the honest you know, reaction. And I think a lot of the American schools abroad, or if it's your home country based in another country, they tend to be really, really good schools. Um, I had another teacher that was on who taught in Saudi Arabia. It was an American school in Saudi Arabia. Actually, his episode will be out later this fall. And it was a wonderful experience. And again, all of the benefits, a lot of respect, a great professional development. So, you know, Sometimes maybe it's the type of school in another country because there's a lot, I'm sure you know much more than I do, there's a lot of different types of international schools right around the Mm -hmm. world. But yeah, if you can email someone and get a contact, and I think that's great, like being connected, you know, with both of you, you know, any resources you have of like how you can get in touch with particular people within these schools would be really beneficial because you don't know until you get there otherwise. Mm-hmm. Well, there is, there's a site that's attempted to do this and it does it to some extent. It's called International Schools Review. Mm. So we've plugged that on our website and on our podcast. The only thing is anytime something's anonymous, you, you have to be aware that the people who are going to go on and and write about a school who are motivated to do that may be the ones who are really complaining about it. And there might be Mm. people there who have had a different experience. So always taking with a grain of salt. But yeah, there are resources out there a little bit for that. And one of the things I'm curious about going forward with your interviews is we've had this massive disruption and there's a very famous professor, I think his name was Clayton Christensen, who said, well, disruptions can be leveraged to bring about change in a very positive way. It can help us adapt. It can help us look at what hasn't worked and then come up with much more conducive ways to get things done. And I think it can be very powerful. And I wonder, I still think we're in the stage right now. We're still grieving. We're still dealing with loss. So many schools in America, as we discussed in your podcast, is that schools are really struggling. They don't have enough teachers, uh, enough support staff. As you pointed out, they're bringing in people who are not licensed. They've just got to get people in the rooms. So I'm wondering going forward, if we're going to start hearing of national governments, hopefully the U.S., Canada, who are going to be coming up with task force to say, okay, we really have to review what happened. We have to come up with plans to be ready for the next pandemic, let alone we need to come up with a way to fix our educational systems on the very human side, because we really have, in a lot of ways, pushed teachers, teaching assistants, uh, administrators to the brink that so many have left. So I'm wondering, I know a part of your format for your episodes is the vision. What what are people, what are they looking 
uh, to make things better in the future? What's their vision of what good teaching and learning looks like? Have you picked up on any themes, any answers there going forward? I feel like there's a macro and micro I could talk about, you know, what we really want to see systematically change and then what maybe we can do as individuals to kind of like internally push some change in our schools. So just macro level, a real issue in America is that there's incredible inequity in public schools. Incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on local and state taxes. And so you could have these failing schools that don't have enough resources, that can't, you know, fund teachers properly in a lot of urban areas. And they're they're the ones even before the pandemic saw the revolving door, right? Teachers always coming mm-hmm. in and out. And then you have affluent areas that, I mean, these are public schools. I'm in an independent school, so it's different. But these are public schools that they have teachers getting paid really high salaries so they can get like the creme de la creme of teachers. They have all the technology. They have the best sports fields. They have the best, you know, different like extracurricular programs. It is drastically different around the country. I don't know how tax wise they can fix this, but I really think there needs to be more federal funding into public Mm -hmm. schools. I mean, it should be, and hopefully what's going on now should push, push an agenda to make funding of at least public education, a top priority. And so funding schools, and then that also will help fund teacher salaries. So it starts with the economy. It starts at the very, very, you know, foundational level of like, you've got to fund this program and education. Every time it's an election year comes around is really not talked about. I would like to to see it being talked about during this election cycle and into like the next presidential election. And maybe it will be because of what's happening So that's the macro level. Also with that, schools are really big. The class sizes are huge. Teachers feel like I can't do the work that I want to do with each child and properly give them support and assess them when I have 35 students in front of me in a class. And then maybe on a roster, you have five classes. You could have over 150 students. That is not sustainable either for a teacher to not only give them attention, but grading and assessing. So how do we get to make sure we have smaller class sizes, which means you're going to have to have more teachers. So, I mean, it's like all a cycle. I think some things we can do internally, at least push within our own districts and schools, is that there needs to be more emphasis on like social emotional education, social emotional learning, which I know, you know, that's something you both have talked about. Mental health, you know, making that a priority. There needs to be more access to counselors in schools. I know from my personal experience, I went to a very big high school and I had a counselor like I barely saw and had hundreds of students like on his roster as a counselor. And it's still that way. It hasn't changed since like the nineties. I mean, at least from my experience and there's just, we have a lot of kids falling through the cracks because of that, because classes are too big. There's not enough support staff and People are burnt out, and so they're not able to really attend to these children in teaching the whole child. And there are a lot of kids, if they don't have that kind of parental support, they're falling through the cracks. And so I think at, like again, district kind of school level, you know, how do we get more programming to focus on social-emotional education? How do we get counselors, more counselors in the school? Making maybe a priority to see the counselor, not be reactive, like I'm having a problem, but start to build a culture of you're going to have a relationship with your counselor and, you know, get to know your counselor. You might not need any support right now, but you might in the future. Like, I think that needs to be a cultural shift in our schools. I mean, that really should be a cultural shift in our whole society. Going to a therapist or going to a counselor can be preventive, right? You can do that like you would do any other kind of medical checkup. But that's really where we're struggling as far as the schools themselves. So one thing I'm doing, again, micro, micro level is trying to get students also off of technology. I feel like we use so much of that during the pandemic and using it, but then taking time to go outside, taking time to journal and handwrite with prompts and whatnot and getting them talking to each other. Like we need to actually like socialize the students again because they like lost it. So there's things I feel I have control of. There's things I can promote in my school, hopefully sharing ideas on the podcast. They're getting out there. 
but there's so much that has to change from the federal government. The funding is just not there. Right. Well, it's interesting when you talk about things like class size, because that is another benefit of going international that we didn't address was uh, the class sizes tend to be capped at 20, mm. maybe 20, 22 sometimes. And that's that's it. And that is a huge advantage. I agree, you know, because we do want to be able to have the opportunity to look at the whole child and to individualize the instructional program to the extent possible. Um, and then I also like the ideas that you that you came up with about uh, what you can do on your level. And, you know, let's all hope that <laughs> at the macro level, things will start to shift. And it feels as though we are going to hit that critical mass of teachers leaving the classroom, through retirement and through frustration that something is going to have to happen because it just won't be a sustainable situation. Yeah, I feel like we have to hit, I hate to say this and sound so dire, but uh, we have to hit rock bottom to then mm-hmm. finally have action. And that's what it's going to take because there were problems before the pandemic um, in education. And a lot of this, again, has just kind of you know, been more um, like shown to us, these holes have been shown to us through the pandemic, but no one, no politician, again, the federal government, they just don't, they never want to prioritize it. They don't want to see it as, you know, something they have to take care of now. I know there's so many other things that need to be addressed, but with a mass exodus, you know, and then seeing over time how it's really going to affect the students, not only education, but again, in increasing their anxiety, increasing like their depression. If they're seeing teachers leaving and then getting emergency people in that maybe are just bodies in a room, how does that student feel about their own education and their own Mm. experience? They're going to feel, you know, like, how am I prepared to be an adult and, you know, to have a good um, lifestyle as a young adult? And so they're not going to feel like we're, investing in them. And one of my first guests I had on the show was one of my good friends from my last school. And she was basically saying, you know, if we don't invest in our school and invest in education, that is signaling like we don't care about the children. We're not investing in them. So it's like the children get the back burner in our country. That is a damn shame. (laughs) Mm, And sadly, that does seem to be the case. So I want to highlight a couple of things that you said. One is wellness, and the second is use of technology. Uh, and for Audrey and I as wellness coaches, we clearly are going to be pushing our schools, our society, our community to find ways to be proactive in supporting the wellness of not only our students, but our teachers. And one of the great things in international schools is the community. In my last school, I did work teaching parents about the tenets of positive psychology and helping them understand character strengths and what we call the PERMA pillars, the aspects of life. If we exercise our strengths within them, like positive emotions and engagement and relationships, et cetera, we can potentially thrive. We can, you know, starting at just average feeling good about life to to really move forth to thrive. And so if we can continue to support those SEL programs uh, that should be in all of the American public schools and private schools too, elementary schools, building that base for students to understand their emotional state, their socially, how to get along with others, but also what we see in the last couple generations almost, I'm going to shift to the technology aspect of it, is that we know there are some benefits to technology and creativity and connectivity, but we also know it can be very isolating and it can take away just that very normal growth and development of young people, as you're saying, of being out in nature, being with one another, face-to-face, learning to communicate, body language. We can go on and on uh, just about how technology can take that away. So I often talk about a sub part of wellness called digital wellness, the whole idea of being aware of how one uses technology and, and not letting the technology use oneself. And that's really what our So many of our technology companies have got their their tentacles into our lives and into our brains. And I just think it's world calamity that we need to find a way to educate students more and more on how to handle that technology and to get them back 
to the normal kind of living of out playing with your friends and having life experiences and making mistakes and learning from them to be upskilled so that when they get to middle school and high school and as they face difficulties, they have a wellness toolkit, something that they can reach in and say, okay, what character strength can I exercise now? And I'm working on my relationships now. So that's kind of my sermon on that topic. So I'm glad that you brought them up. And I really do think, like you are back to earlier, we are in a crisis and we need to take on these very big themes in a united fashion. Mm-hmm. Well, Jackie, You just have such a a wonderful perspective on things and such great suggestions. And we're so glad that you came on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Before we finish up, can you please tell our listeners how they can follow you if they want to learn more about teachers and their stories? Sure. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be on your podcast. I really enjoyed um, meeting both of you originally and then being able to interview you on, on my podcast. And so this has been great. So I am very active on LinkedIn. So you can find uh, my formal name on LinkedIn is Jacqueline Scully, since there seems to be a lot of Jackie Scullys. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's Jacqueline Scully. And then I, so I'm on there, I post quite a bit, not just about my podcast, but just my experience, you know, live kind of going through the school year and my kind of ponderings of life in general. On LinkedIn, I also co-founder of the Teacher Circle. So it's another great support group in LinkedIn and it's international too. So we have teachers from all over the world that are on there and also maybe people that are administrators or just other people who want to support education and teachers that are part of that that group. So you can look for that, the teacher circle. I have a website called theteacherstory.com. I'm on all of the major podcast platforms. So you can look for the teacher story on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whatnot. And my Instagram, I'm pretty active on too. Facebook, I'm on and off, but Instagram, I'm pretty active as well. And I'm at Jackie.c.scully. Excellent. Excellent. And I want to highlight just the importance for our listeners to follow you, especially our international educators who are thinking about coming back to the U.S. Mm. And I guess you also, you are sharing from international educators also, but I think that's a real service that you're offering to let people say, okay, I'm thinking about going back to the U.S. What's kind of the lay of the land? And they can pick that up from your podcast. So thanks for that service, Jackie. You're welcome. So thank you again for having me on your show. Thank you for being on the show and keep on sharing teacher stories. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Educators Going Global. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other usual suspects. Please subscribe, like us, and leave a review on Apple and Spotify, and let your teaching friends know about us so we can grow our community. Please reach out at educatorsgoingglobal at gmail.com and join our Facebook group, Educators Going Global, if you have ideas, comments, or wish to share a going global story of your own. You can also find us on Instagram at Educators Going Global. Please visit our website as well, www.educatorsgoingglobal.com. All our podcast episodes are on there by topic, along with blog posts, going global stories, and our ever-growing resource library. For now, this is Audrey and David inviting you to travel, teach, and connect with us.